We're going to be starting a new sermon series today uh, that's going to take place over the next few weeks called Why, uh, Lies We Believe. And just the premise of this, uh, and kind of what inspired this, is uh, honestly, we're assailed on a, on a daily basis by claims of truth that on face value seem legitimate, but when really analyzed are biblically false. And what I mean by this is what I would call fluff theology or, or kind of just, you know, bumper sticker theology, the kind of thing that you hear like, um, and we'll be talking about some of these in the weeks to come, like God will never give you more than we c- you can handle. Um, that's just biblically false. Um, or today we're going to talk about we're all God's children, um, or God wants me to be happy, or, um, you know, he wants me to have my best life now, things like that. Those are those claims, though they seem, you know, innocent enough on the surface, are actually very dangerous claims. And we're going to be taking a look at some of those claims and then matching that up against what Scripture says is truth and what God says about some of those topics. So Scripture is actually filled with warnings, um, especially in the New Testament, but Old Testament as well, is filled with warnings against false teachings. And false teaching is the idea of something that is just, it's, it's wrong. It doesn't line up with what God says is true. And if, if God is the author of truth, then we go to him for truth. And um, we have to be careful because there's a lot of false teaching out there. And I'm not talking about, the purpose of this sermon series isn't to get everybody to agree with me theologically. Uh, and we're not going to be talking about things that are, um, you know, I'll be honest, very biblically divisive. Things like, we're not talking about things like, you know, what's your view of predestination versus free will or something like that. You know, there's, bibl- there's Christians that b- believe different views on things like that and, and have biblical reason to believe those views. We're not talking about that kind of thing. There's all kinds of room to have difference of, uh, of views on, on things like that. What we're talking about are things that... that Maybe our society or um, in, in our culture or, um, you know, or just honestly false teachers, whether they realize it or not, are promoting that actually are contrary to the gospel and the truth of scripture. So we're talking about things that are essential and basic to the Christian faith, not matters of theological opinion. Um, so... I'm not one to quickly throw out the label of false teaching or false teacher against something or someone just because I disagree with them. You know, um, I, I have brothers and sisters in Christ that I theologic, that I disagree with about things that are non-essentials, and that's just fine. What we're talking about here are, are, are real, serious, biblical, false teachings, things that just don't line up with Scripture at all. Um, like you'd have to do gymnastics to get them to even remotely uh, resemble what Scripture says. So, and the problem here is the danger is that false teaching leads us to misunderstand who God is, and by extension, who we are in who we are in relation to Him. So um, that's really going to be apparent with our with our our topic today. So we're going to be spending several weeks looking at common claims of truth that Christians sometimes believe but are biblically false and dangerous. So with, with that in mind, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer and dive into God's word today um, for us. Lord Jesus, we need your spirit to be present. We need you to speak your truth. We need you to be our teacher, our leader, and our guide. Lord, it's so easy to, to buy into half-truths. Help us to see what you say and to believe what you say and to act on what you say. Help us to guard our minds and our hearts. So lead us into all truth and we ask your spirit to take control. In Jesus' name, amen. So the claim that we're going to be looking at this week is the claim that we are all God's children. And... um. This is a claim that, that at its surface actually sounds like it's pretty biblically true. Like, hey, we're, we're, we're all God's children, right? 
But when it's said, it normally has an undertone. And what I mean by that is at the surface, like I said, it claims to be true, but um, and it, you could even, I've even heard um, people use, like point to different scriptures and say like, look, see, isn't this what it says? Uh, and an example, we're going to get deeper into this text later. This is from Acts chapter 17, verse 28. This is Paul here. It says, for, and he's quoting someone else, in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. And this is, this is Paul speaking to philosophers in Athens, um, and we're going to get into a little bit more of the context of this a little bit later. Um, and he's actually here, he's, where it says, in him we live and move and have our being, and for we are indeed his offspring. He's actually quoting Greek poets, not, not scripture or something like that. He's quoting Greek poets. We'll talk about that um, a little bit later. Uh, but I've, I've actually personally had conversations with people about um, this claim that, like, we're all God's children, you know, um, uh, and, and, and what they mean by that is at the heart of this claim is that a relationship with God is something that is innate to the human experience. In other words, every human being has this certain type of relationship with God. And it is true that we all, every human being does have a relationship with God, but that relationship is not that of father and child. And the claim is that it is, that we have this intimate relationship with God just naturally. That's just, that's just what it means to be human we have this relationship with God. Um, and, and this is dangerous because it can lead us to believe that we and everyone else are okay with God. Like that it just, hey, we have this, you know, this default okayness with God. And there's some other false teachings that are related to this. Uh, those include, you might hear things that like, you know, people are basically good, humans are basically good, um, or all roads lead to God. These are all tied into the same kind of mentality. You know, when people say we're all God's children, they can sometimes be saying things like, listen, you might have your God and I have my God and they've got their God, but come on, they're all, God, God is God is God and we're all God's children. You know, we might all believe different things, but it doesn't matter in the end. We're all fine. Or the idea of like, we're all basically good. You know, we're good people. I just, you know, honestly, some of what in, has inspired I feel like God's led me to talk about this is, you know, you spend any time on social media uh, and you see Christians posting things about how like, you know, generally speaking, I'm a good person and I've got to remind myself that I'm just good. I'm just good. And that's just biblically incorrect. We're not just good. Uh, people's default setting is not good or okay with God. That is not the human default. And, and it's dangerous for us to assume that of ourselves. And it's extremely dangerous and against the very mission of Christ to assume that of other people as well. So let's, let's look at the context to the text that I quoted earlier, um, where Paul in Acts chapter 17 is speaking and he, and he quotes these, these these uh, poets, these Greek poets, let's look at what is going on and what he says here. So um, whenever we look at any claim of truth, okay, we must measure it against what God has revealed in Scripture. That's con what we call context, right? We have to, um, the context is looking at where does like any claim lie within the context of Scripture. So if somebody says, um, you know, Adam, uh, Adam and Eve, they ate that, that apple and that messed everything up. You know, not to be nitpicky about it, but Scripture doesn't say anything about an apple. Uh, it doesn't appear anywhere in Scripture. That idea of the forbidden fruit, which also doesn't appear anywhere in Scripture, that phrase, um, but the, 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 the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil uh, being an apple, that's not a biblical thing at all. That was, uh, that's probably introduced by Milton in his book Paradise Lost. Um, but if we just, you know, you know, pick ideas instead of looking at scripture. So if somebody says, well, like, oh, you know, apples are bad for you. Look what happened to Adam and Eve. I'd be like, what are you, what are you talking about? Well, let's look at what scripture says. Is that, does that have anything to do with what happened with Adam and Eve? No, not at all. Not at all. So you, we have to look, we have to test every claim against scripture to see whether it's true. But even then, in order to properly understand what scripture means, we have to look at the context of any given passage. 
we have to look at its location and what's going on around it. Um, you know, when we talk about su studying scripture, it's, it's kind of like uh, doing real estate. Location is everything, right? The three most important things in, in real estate are location, location, location. With scripture, it's the same thing. When we, when we read a text, we can't just cherry pick out one verse and take it out of the context of what's going on around it. Otherwise, we can kind of get it to say whatever we want. A classic example I often use with people is if you were to just flip through scripture and say, oh, Lord, speak to me. And the, the old story goes, a man was doing that and he was in dist distress and he flips through scripture and he says, Lord, speak to me. And, and he flips open a passage in the Gospels and said, Judas did hang himself. He's like, oh, I don't know, uh, that's not it. And he flips somewhere else and he says, go and do likewise. Well, obviously that's not what God was saying, you know, and that's, that story's probably made up. But the point is, those are two verses that have nothing to do with one another. They're taken out of context and put together to say something completely different. We have to be careful when we look at Scripture or any claim that people make about Scripture to look at its context. See, Scripture is clear about God himself that God does not change. And his word does not change. I, I hope we believe that. And if we believe that, then Scripture cannot mean something today that it didn't mean when it was originally written. Now, it can have applications today that obviously the original authors of Scripture could have no idea about. Obviously, they didn't have social media or, or the Internet or, or cars or electricity. Or, so, you know, some of those, we might have applications today that are different than um, that would be unique to our, our setting. However, we can't make Scripture say whatever we want. We have to look at what it meant in its original context. So we're going to do that right now um, with this text that, that I quoted from earlier that I've, I've had quoted to me in several settings about kind of this idea of like, we all belong to God. Our default setting with God is we're his children, which means he's our father. God is the father of all. We're all good. We're all in this good, healthy relationship with God. Let's look at the context to Acts, those verses, um, by looking at Acts 17. We're going to start in verse 22. Um, just, and even to back up a little further, Paul is in Athens, um, uh, bringing the gospel to Athens, uh, for him at least the first time. Uh, and he, he's not having a great response from people. And... Uh, um, they actually, the, 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 the philosophers and, and kind of thinkers of the day of Athens, um, and Athens was known for its philosophy, uh, kind of called him, they called him a babbler. Actually, literally in Greek, it says he was a cherry picker. They're like, what is this cherry picker saying? Because he's, he's taking their ideas and using them and, and kind of out of context. And they're like, what is this guy doing? And, and this is Paul responding to them. And this is what he says. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, that's the marketplace, uh, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. Actually, that word means kind of like superstitious. For as I passed along and observed the uh, objects of your worship, I found also an altar with the inscription, To the unknown God. Now I'm just going to stop there. The idea was that the, the people of Athens, they had all kinds of gods. You know, they had all the Greek gods and they kind of bring in other, uh, other gods from other re religions and, and they'd have all, they've had temples and altars to them everywhere. And they had this one that was to an unknown god. And the idea was it was a catch-all. It was like, just in case we missed any, here's to the ones we don't know about. But Paul uses this and he says, the god, um, what, what therefore you worship is unknown this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For, and this is where he quotes, in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an 
an image formed by the art and imagination of man, the times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now the rest of this context is when the, the crowds hear this, especially some of the philosophers, they, he starts talking about resurrection from the dead and they, they write him off. They're like, we don't want to hear it. But it, we're actually told that some other people were interested to hear what he had to say. So what's going on here? Well, Paul actually uses the Greek philosopher's own logic to point out some hard truths for them. In a sense, he's pointing them to, he said, you know, he's saying, listen, you, you have your own way of thinking and your own belief system, and, and even within your own way of thinking and belief system, you've come to believe some things, and he points these out. Uh, the first is that humanity finds its source in God. In fact, it says that we're um, all God's offspring. Um, the word offspring there is this Greek word ganas. And it's actually where we get the word Genesis from. It means we are all God's creations. Now, we hear the word offspring and we think children, right? We think like, oh, you know, my offspring. I've got three boy offsprings and one girl offspring. I have three sons and a daughter. Um, Sure, but the word ganas here, it's just generic to mean, um, you know, the thing that comes from something else. Um, and, and we'll talk about it. Really, the, the, the gist of this is we're all God's creation. That's true. But this term ganas doesn't have any kind of relational aspect to it. It has a relational aspect in terms of saying um, the way that a, you know, a piece of art has a relationship to the artist, but not the same way that a child has a relationship to their parent, their father, in this case. It's, it's, not, it's not a human relationship with dynamics and interaction. It's more like, hey, he might have made me, but I don't have any rela- like, you know, ongoing relationship with him. That's the claim that Paul is, is making here is, is that, listen, you all believe that we all were made by God. And then he says, but God is not found in that which we make. In other words, he says, listen, you can make statues and, and all the kinds of things and say, well, this is what God is like. And, and he said, you, you're not going to find God in those things. In other words, we are made by him. We can't make things and say that's what he's like. And this is actually a call out to their idolatry. He's like, look at this. You guys are superstitious. You're religious. You have all of these statues to all of these gods. And you even have one to the unknown God, just in case. And he's like, let me tell you about the just in case. You have this all backwards. He's pointing out to them the ridiculousness of what their, of their thought process here. Because even their own thinking is, we are created by some create, you know, some God. And, and yet, and, and by the way, in, in every, pretty much every religion, uh, including the, re- the, the common religion of Greece of that day, there was a belief that humans were created by a God, not multiple gods, just one made humans. Um, even if they believed in multiple gods, they always believed that kind of one of them made humans. Um, and and he, he's using their own way of thinking to show them the ridiculousness of it. But then he also says, listen, this unknown God, he does want to be known by you. He wants to be known by us. He wants a relationship. He doesn't want to just be our creator. He wants to be more than that. He wants a real, active, loving relationship. Now, it would be correct. See, this is, this is the thing about every, tr- um, every kind of claim of truth. The best lies are always half-truths. The, the claim we're all God's children is half-true in that we are all created by God. But child, and we're going to look at a text a little bit in just a few minutes that talks about this, implies relationship. And 
the implication here is by saying we're all God's children or misunderstanding what Paul's getting at here and saying we all innately have this, this positive relationship with God. The lie is that it's positive and that it is uh, mutual. But let's be honest, most human beings don't act that way. In fact, a, a lot of our founding fathers were in this camp, along with a lot of other people and a lot of philosophers, uh, that got to a place of what we call deism. Theism is the belief that there is a God, um, a God who is personal and, and involved in the world that he's made. Deism is this, uh, not, not the relationship piece, but the he made us all. He made it all. And that's about all we can say about him. Uh, he, you know, it's, it's the image of he's a clockmaker. He's wound up the, you know, created the universe. He wound it up and he's just letting it spin. But he's not in, really involved. That, that's kind of the mentality of, of saying like we're all his offspring. It just means that he created us all. But God's desire, as Paul points out here, is to have a real relationship with us. And, and he says, he doesn't use the name Jesus here, but he does a little bit later in the text. He, he says, which is available to us through Jesus, this one man who's, who's when God isn't going to overlook our ignorance, as he puts it, but a day of, of judgment's coming. And he says, uh, he's making this relationship available through Jesus when we repent and trust him. And this word repent is huge. In fact, the word repent is the thing that makes this whole claim that we innately have this, that every human being innately has this positive relationship with our creator. The word repent flies in the face of that. Repent means that we are messing up and we need to change. <clears throat> now, we're going to get into John chapter 1 here in just a second, but... I think a good illustration of this, I, I have several friends who grew up as missionary kids in different parts of the world. I have, I have a lot of friends that are missionaries even currently. And one common story that you hear among missionaries is this idea of, of this, this intrinsic knowledge that people have of God everywhere you go. And the story goes something like this, and some of you have heard me tell this story before, but I think it's important in the light of what we're talking about. <clears throat> um, one of the stories I, I'm aware of is from, from inland China, kind of on the, uh, to, uh, the, the border of almost Tibet, Nepal, and China. Um, uh, this is from a couple generations ago, but a, a missionary supposedly, the story goes, went to this village to share the gospel with these people for the first time. And, um, you know, like very, very rural, very ag agrarian, meaning, you know, farm kind of village. And they came and he, and he shared the gospel, the basic message that God sent his son Jesus to die for our sins so that might, we might have a relationship with him. And when, when this message is shared, you know, the, the, People of the village are like, oh, we know this story. And, and the missionary's a little taken back by that. And he's like, well, oh, I didn't think any missionary had ever been here before. And they said, well, no, no, let, let's, let's us explain. You know, and there's often some variation of this story that um, in this particular case, one of the, their elders, you know, maybe a generation or two before, had been out plowing in a field with an ox cart and he, uh, and he had a, he had a stone fly up and break his thumb. And, and because his thumb was broken, he, he suddenly realized, you know, he wasn't able to do the work he would normally do, which gives you more time to sit around and think. I think we're all aware of what that's like right now. Um, and, and in that process, he began to think about how important it is to have a working thumb. You know, when you look around at the animals around us and none of the rest of them have working thumbs, and you think, man, whoever made me must love me to have this, given me this, this beautiful gift of a thumb. I mean, how little can you do without your thumbs? Which led him to the idea of like, if this, if my creator, so that he, it leads you to the idea of a creator, if my creator loves me so much that he would create me with a thumb, 
then why don't I have interaction with this creator? If he loves me, then where is he? Which let, leads the man to the idea that something must be wrong in our relationship. And if he's this you know, great, loving creator that's so powerful, it must be something I've done, not him. And if it's something I've done, then how can I fix that? Hopefully in his love, he'll reach out and try to fix it. And honestly, if you think about it, that's the basics of the gospel, right? That we have a creator who loves us, but we have a broken relationship with him. And out of his love, he came into the world to fix it through Jesus. And so the idea is when he shares the, the, this missionary shares the gospel, they put all the pieces together and they just say, we just didn't know how he fixed it. See, the innate thing is that we are all created by God. That's what we all understand. But that we, w- there's also this innate thing that if we really sit and think should lead us to this idea that we have a broken relationship. Now, that's actually what Paul is getting at. And that's actually why it's so important that we have right theology about this. And I, and I realize, in some ways, I'm probably preaching to the converted. I, I realize that most of you probably, um, most of you watching this probably believe this already. They're like, well, of course, we need Jesus. I get it. I mean, isn't that what we talk about at Easter every year? Isn't that what the church is all about? We need Jesus. Yes. But when we don't believe that, really believe it when it it's one of those things that we say that we believe then it it can often become something that we don't actually act on and that's that's what we're getting at here so i, I want to look at another section of scripture that clearly states you know the, the claim is we're all just by default god's children but i want to show you something that god inspired john to write as he wrote his gospel This is from John chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. It says, The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Look at that. The true light, this is obviously a reference to Jesus. This is John 1. The true light, Jesus was coming into the world. He gives light to everybody, right? Without differentiation. And the world was even made through him, and yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people didn't receive him. This flies in the face of the idea that we're we're all in this great relationship with God, because when God comes to us, we reject him. But then look what it says here. This is verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This flies in the face of the... When we read the scripture and understand it correctly, this flies in the face of the idea of of some universalism, of some sense that all gods are the same God or we're all just default in a good place with God. We're all good people. It flies in the face of all of that. God has come to man to make himself known, the scripture claims. And this happened through the incarnation of Jesus. That's what John chapter 1 is about, that Jesus took on our humanity to make God known to us. And yet, often, we reject Jesus. That our, our default is actually rejection of God, not acceptance. But when we believe in Jesus and receive him into our lives, we become God's children. In fact, the New Testament authors talk about this repeatedly, especially Paul, by using the image of adoption. That adoption is how we become children of God. We are not God's children because we're born into the right family. We become God's children because we become adopted. 
this great act of love on God's behalf chooses us to be his. Not because we were born in the right family or, or are just good people. And God just was like, oh, I want, yeah, I made all these great people. No, we're sinful. And yet God in his love reaches out to us. And he invites us into his family through Jesus. And the term that's used here for children is not the word genos, creation. It's actually the word techna. Now, don't confuse us with the word technology. They're not actually related. Those are separate terms. They're, they're, they're similar. This is actually a term, however, of relationship, not simply creation. Techna means children. It means those who not only come from you know, not only your offspring, but those that you're in relationship to. I think a better way to understand this is maybe f for us is there's a difference between having kids and being a father. I have kids. But being a father is something different. That's a choice that, that we have to make daily. Being a parent, being involved in our, parent, in our children's lives, being sacrificial towards them and loving them and doing what is best for them even when they don't like you for it, even when you don't want to do it. That's something different than just siring a child. One of the ways that, it, that it's talked about in the New Testament is the difference between calling God simply Father and calling him Daddy. Our daughter Raya is uh, about seven and a half, almost eight months old right now. And she's saying one word. <laughs> she says one word. And my wife is, is you know, just says, ah, she's just making noise. She doesn't know what she's saying. And today I was sitting on the couch with her and I looked at her and I said, hi, Raya, can you say Dada? And she, that's her one word. And, and, and Julie just says, oh, she says that about everything, but she looked right at me and she was like, dad, dad. Sometimes she goes, dad, 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 and just nonsense. But she like looked at me and said, dad, dad. And I was like, I don't know if she's making that connection, but that's who I want to be. I want to be dad, dad. I want to have that, that deep connection with her. That's what this is about. Actually, Scripture says here, not only do we have the ability here to become children of God because of Jesus, that we can enter into this relationship, this positive, loving relationship with God, but he actually says, God actually says here that we have the power and authority to live as such. Now, you might not see it that way, but it actually says this when it says, he gave them the right to become children of God. The word right there, it's one of my favorite words in Greek. It's the word exousia. And it means power and authority. It doesn't simply mean like, yeah, you can be God's children, I guess, if you want, figure it out. It means that Jesus not only allows us to come into God's family to be adopted, but then also gives us the ability to live as part of that family. He gives us the strength and the power and the authority to be children of God. In a sense, what it's like is saying we're adopted into the family, but we're still treated like second-class citizens. That's not what Jesus offers us. He says you're adopted in and you're fully in. In fact, we're so fully in that he says, let me give you my spirit to live inside of you. As a result of the new birth, this new beginning, remember, not, not born of the will of man, but born of the Spirit. This new birth we have, as a result of this, this power and authority comes as a result of the new birth we have in the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit at work in us. And I want you to look at these two texts here. This is Romans 8.15 and Galatians 4.6. 
I want you to notice this. These are the two places in the New Testament that the word daddy appears in relationship to God. Now, in Aramaic, the word daddy is Abba. Abba. It was very easy to say, like dada. Abba. Abba, Father. Listen to what it says. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Daddy, Father, Abba, Father. This is the cry of one who, who has this loving, deep connection with God as Father. Not this idea of like, well, I guess he made me. Again, in Galatians 4, 6, and because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The claim that we're all God's children is dangerous because it takes this out of it. Does the world default? Do people in the world who don't know Jesus default say, I'm going through something. <sighs> Have I spent time with my, my daddy today? I don't think so. In fact, technically speaking, we can't. We can't come to the Father except through Jesus. Jesus says this in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's no way to have this relationship with God except through Jesus. And that's why what we believe matters. That's why we're talking about this. If all humans are innately in relationship with God, as this claim states, and if that relationship is essential for us to be who we're supposed to be, and if that relationship is only available through Jesus. Now listen, let me back up. The claim is we're all innately in a relationship with God. Well, we are. The relationship is that of creator and creation. Not father, not daddy and child. If that relationship is essential for us to be who we're supposed to be, we can't be who we're created to be by our creator unless we're in a good, loving relationship with him. And if that relationship is only available through Jesus, then everyone, including us, needs Jesus. That's it. We need Jesus. And everyone else does too. The truth, and this truth should compel us to know him and to share him with everyone. And folks, this is why it's important for us to discuss this. Because we might claim that we believe that the only way to have a relationship with God that we all desperately need is through Jesus. But do we live out that conviction? Do we go to our friends and our family and our neighbors and say, you need Jesus. I need Jesus. Do we understand that for ourselves, that we need Jesus daily? We need him. That we cannot coast through life that our lives are empty and meaningless without Jesus, that we can't have a real relationship with God and cannot be who we are created to be without Jesus. If we believe that, we would pour everything into that relationship and we would do everything in our power. We would go out of our way to make sure that other people know him too. So here's our so what. Are we God's children because we have a relationship with him through Jesus? What about our families, our friends, our neighbors? Do they know Jesus? Do they know that they need Jesus? Listen, we can't make anybody put their trust in Jesus, but boy, we certainly can make sure that they know that they need him and that he wants a relationship with them. If they don't, if we don't, what are we doing about that? If you hear this claim, we're all God's children, you say, well, that's ridiculous. We know that's not true. Are we living like that's not true? Are we living like the default is we're all just fine? 
you know, this pandemic that we're going through and everything that's going on with it is such an opportunity for the church to show the world that the answer isn't what we come up with. What I mean by that is what, what human beings have to offer. The answer to the, to the burning questions of life, the answer to the uncertainty that we face is the certainty of who God is. And we see that only through the person and the work of Jesus. This is our meditation verse for this week. I really encourage you to chew on this. This is Paul speaking to the, to the crowds in Athens. He says, The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. That means to turn to God because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he gives. He has given his assurance to all by raising him from the dead. We know who this man is. This man is Jesus. Do we believe this statement to be true? The times of ignorance are done. We need to make Jesus known. We need to know him. Let me go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we need we can even we can't even call you that honestly we can't call you father unless we know you because of Jesus bring us into that relationship with you because we have a relationship with your son our brother lord help us not to take our relationship with you for granted And help us not to assume that other people know you. Whether they grew up in the church or not, whether they, they, you know, had access to hearing the gospel, they went to camp, they said a prayer one time, it doesn't matter, Lord. We need to know you. We need you. And we need to make you known, Lord. Please give us courage. Give us opportunity. And give us your spirit to strengthen us. Lord, we can make the claim that we are all God's children if we know you. But not everyone knows you, Lord. It is our job to make you known. Help us to do that. Help us to show your love to those around us, our friends and our family, our neighbors, our coworkers, the people we don't get along with. Lord, help us to make you known. We can't do that if we don't know you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the weeks to come, we are going to be talking about some of these other these other claims. I already mentioned a couple of them. Um, next week, we're going to talk about the, um, the claim that God will never give you more than you can handle. There's some others as well, but I encourage you in the, that if, if as we're going through this sermon series or something that one of those kind of claims that God kind of puts in front of you and you're like, what about this? I encourage you to reach out to me and, and bring that to my attention. Be like, what about this? You know, I hear this all the time um, because we need to address those things. We need to be equipped as God's people to face the lies of the devil and the world with the truth of God. God bless you. Have a great day.